Okay, great. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here for this midday webinar. Um, my name is Kelsey Meehan. I'm a grazing and dairy specialist with UVM Extension. We're really happy to have Dr. John Winston here today presenting on his research about larger herd, the larger herd low overhead dairy grazing model and its applications in the Northeast. Um, this work and my work in part is funded by the Northeast Dairy Business Innovation Center. So thank you to them. Um, also thank you to Glenda Pereira of UMaine Extension and Sarah Allen of University of New Hampshire Extension who helped to put this webinar together. Um, housekeeping things we are recording. Um, we have live captioning provided by Carolyn from UVM today. So I will paste that link in the chat and you can just click that link. I might repost that as people join. So it's available. Um, please mute if you're not speaking or asking a question um, to limit background noise. You can have your camera on or off. Um, we'll do about 40 minutes of John presenting his work and then leave about 20 minutes for question and answer and discussion. If you have questions, please write them in the chat if you'd like, um, or you can save them to the end and, and ask those yourself. Um, I will monitor the chat if there's any just clarification questions um, as we go along. And then, um, yeah, I'll turn it over to John to introduce himself and his work. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks very much, Kelsey and uh, and Glenda and Sarah. Also, I really appreciate you guys uh, helping to put this together, and I appreci appreciate everybody uh, who's on taking the time. Um, uh, you know, if things aren't clear as I'm going through, please um, indicate so either by speaking up or raising your electronic hand in in Zoom. Um, I do want to contain most of the discussion until the end, but uh, I certainly don't want uh, to be moving forward if there's some critical information that that's not clear. So um, as introduced, uh, my name's John Winston. I, I'm an agricultural economist. Uh, I'm based in Vermont. Uh, my dad had a dairy farm, a very typical one for the time back in the in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, you know, 60 cows, registered Holsteins, um, um, you know, I, um, those farms, I think, mostly don't exist very much anymore. But uh, I spent, after college, I spent a year in New Zealand, and I worked on a bunch of farms, and it was really uh, eye-opening to me how different it was in the way they produce milk there. Um, I have always thought that model to be a really um, valuable one from a, an efficiency standpoint and a profitability standpoint, but it always seemed too different from the way we produce milk around here in the Northeast um, to get much traction. However, uh, sadly, the way things have changed recently in the dairy sector with so many farms going out of business um, and, and such sort of rapid consolidation towards fewer larger farms, uh, it seems like maybe it's time to, to consider this. So, so this analysis, uh, and I hope what we've done and why we've done it will be clear in the presentation but it's really about, um, about trying to understand the economics of, of this system. Oh, let me share my screen. I'm sorry, I thought I had done that already. Uh, sorry, that's not the right screen. One more time. Okay. Kelsey, can you see my first slide there? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. So, um, see if I can get these to advance. Okay. So I want to give you just a sort of a roadmap of, of what we're talking about in this webinar. Um, and the whole thing really is predicated on this idea of how can we have profitable agriculture on permanent vegetative cover? And in my opinion, um, dairy grazing is maybe the best way to do that. So what I'm going to talk about um, are some basics of dairy farm financial analysis and some context of the current dairy sector. 
And the reason just to help the understanding of why we're doing what we're doing and, and help understand some of the numbers that follow. Because then I'm going to talk about, I'm going to describe this larger herd, low overhead dairy grazing system uh, and provide some results, excuse me, from some financial analysis that we've done, as well as uh, some environmental modeling. So the, the takeaway points really that I guess I, I hope you have when we're done is that um, the dairy sector needs, farmers need a viable alternative to this current trend of get big or get out, which really seems to have intensified in, in recent years for sort of obvious reasons. Um, also that that the amount of investment required on your typical dairy farm and usually the amount of debt that's associated with that can cause cash flow to be the most important um, metric for a, a dairy farmer as opposed to making decisions based on profitability. This low overhead dairy grazing, which I use this LODGE acronym, uh, this system, the, the efficiencies inherent in it that I'm going to describe are feed efficiency, labor efficiency, and sort of uniquely this capital efficiency. This is really where the low overhead part comes in. Um, the, the ultimate result, I mean, the most important economic metric and financial metric, in my opinion, is the net farm income or profitability per hundred weight of milk produced and sold. And in the analysis that we've done, we get two dollar uh, an average of two dollars and ninety three cents per hundred weight of profit. And just to put that into some context, that's more than about seventy percent more than what I was able to collect from the same time period from the Northeast Dairy Farm summaries that averages about a dollar seventy one. And then ultimately, really, this seems like a win win uh, system, more profitable and with some environmental and social benefits. So a little bit about the basics of dairy farm financial analysis. There's three big, uh, uh, the big three uh, financial uh, statements are the cash flow statement, which tells you, you know, can you pay your bills? It includes principal payments because that's a cash outflow. It does not include depreciation because that's not a cash expense. It's, it's an important one, but it can be deferred. What we're um, mostly focused on in this work is the income statement, also called the profit and loss statement. Um, and that allows you to calculate net farm income. And I sometimes use net farm income from operations just to, what that means is basically it doesn't include non-farm income which is hugely important to a lot of dairy farm families, but is not relevant to the dairy farm business, right? Whether you have a spouse who's a doctor uh, or one who, who earns a lower wage um, shouldn't be reflected in, in the profitability of the dairy farm business. So net farm income from operations is really what we look at. We look at that per hundredweight. In the income statement, it's it's not just cash accounting, it's accrual accounting. So you're adjusting for changes in um, inventories and accounts receivable, all that kind of stuff from year to year. So making the appropriate adjustments. It does include depreciation because while it's not necessarily a cash expense, it is a real expense for sustaining the operation over time. Um, but you don't include principal in there because the principal payments are really sort of a trade between you and the lender. Um, and then the last of these three is the balance sheet, right? And this tells you what you own, what you owe, and the difference is your net worth. And the reason I even mention it is because I do talk about rate of return on assets. And that is a metric on the efficiency of the farm's assets at producing a profit. And I think that's important. That's a way to compare the investment in dairy versus the investment in a certificate of deposit or anything else. So um, it's fairly, it's a fairly important metric, even though it's not really widely looked at within the dairy community, as far as I can tell. So a couple of other points on um, basic dairy farm financial analysis. Direct costs are those that result directly from producing milk, right? And, and um, these might, they're very much related to, but not exactly the same as variable costs, right? So things like grain 
fuel, fertilizer, those are direct costs. And then I wanna differentiate this because as expressed in the title of this presentation, this is about low overhead dairy grazing. So what are the overhead costs? They're the costs of maintaining and running the farm, buildings, machinery, equipment, um, that kind of stuff. So a little bit of uh, context on the dairy sector, right? This is um, a graph that I have borrowed from the Northeast Dairy Farm Summary that that Farm Credit System puts out. And I think it's based on, on some other data, but you can see around the year 2000, the milk, the farm gate milk price really started to get highly variable. And it was in an upward trajectory till about 2014 when it took a nosedive and it's been more or less floundering around since then with a few ups and a, and a lot of downs. That of course, milk prices are really impactful on farm profitability and net. So this graph of net earnings per cow just basically reflects the same kind of thing. Huge variability um, in, in net earnings per cow starting around the year 2000 and continuing. I also want to talk about, and, and I thought about eliminating this slide because, well, it's a little complex but I think it's an important concept in here. And, and um, it's what I'm calling the overhead cost dilemma, right? And, and this really applies mostly to traditional dairy farms. They generally have a fair bit of money tied up in buildings and equipment. Um, and if that's debt financed or largely debt financed, relatively high debt, and I say relatively because that's relative to the number of cows you have, right? So if you have a, in a traditional farm, you usually have a finite number of stalls, whether it's a tie stall barn or a free stall or whatever. So many cows you can house and you end up with, with high overhead costs per cow. In addition to the direct costs you have in producing milk, you're carrying all of this overhead, okay? And therefore, in order to um, keep cash flow positive, you need to have maximum milk production per cow. And there's some implications of this. One, it's not conducive for grazing because generally, maybe almost always all else equal, you're gonna produce less milk per cow in a grazing system than in a confinement feeding system where you can control what they're being fed and eating. Uh, and they're not expending as much energy to get their feed. So also, though, I think this situation of, of um, high overhead costs per cow, it, it really ends up in a situation where cash flow trumps profitability. Um, and cash flow needs to be, um, well, it needs to be positive for farmers, but it can inhibit more profitable decisions being made. So for example, um, you know, what economics tells you is that when the price of what you're producing goes up, that's a signal to producers to produce more, right? We all learned that in Econ 101. Um, and when the price goes down, you should produce less of that product and switch to something else. Well, there's the problem right there is that you have this overhead costs tied up in this dairy specific buildings and equipment machinery and, um, uh, you can't switch to something else. So when the price of milk goes down, in order to maintain cash flow, you got to figure out a way to produce more milk. So whether price goes up or goes down, you want to produce more milk. And I think that adds to, if not the primary reason why we're seeing so much increased volatility in the price of milk. Just my theory, <laughs> but I think that might be part of what's going on. I wanna say just a little bit about the large modern confinement dairy production. Um, it's really about efficiency, right? Maximizing output from a given level of inputs. It's about economies of scale, which is really a, a capital efficiency and trying to spread costs out over maximum hundred weights of milk produced. And I'm endlessly impressed when I visit these large operations of hundreds or thousands of cows. Um, the management that's required and the way I see these run is really impressive. And my hat uh, is off to all the folks who, who can do that. However, I also think that 
those farms are a tightrope for many reasons. One, the animal physiology in terms of pushing the cows with such a hot ration to get that level of milk per cow causes all kinds of metabolic disorders. Um, it's just accepted that cull rates are going to be 30, 35, 40%, which I've never understood from an economic standpoint, how you justify that. Um, it seems to be a labor tightrope, right, in terms of trying to find people who are willing to milk cows, and um, uh, that's difficult. It's an environmental tightrope also because you're concentrating nutrients with all that grain and fertilizer being brought on to a farm where the stocking rate in terms of animals per acre gets quite high, it becomes really difficult and there are serious nutrient management issues to be faced. And then I think it's also a financial tightrope because it, it seems to me to be about slim margins over a lot of hundredweights. And that seems to work when it's a slim positive margin, but when that slips to a slim negative or not so slim negative margin over a lot of hundredweights, that's not a good financial situation. So that's my take on the large modern confinement dairy. I want to talk a little bit about, well, I want to talk a lot about the low overhead dairy grazing model. What is it? And when I say low overhead, well, how do you reduce overhead costs per cow? And really more importantly, per hundred weight of milk produced. Um, it's not the case that you, you know, that the 60 cow herd like my dad had, will just figure out how to sell some tractors and get rid of some buildings. That's, I don't think works at all, and it's not at all what we're talking about. What, what we are talking about is how to find an efficient way to increase your herd size. And a couple of important ways to do that are to have some kind of an efficient milking system with a high throughput of cows per hour per person and an efficient feeding system, right? Because this, this is really all about labor efficiency. And try to maximize the ratio of the value of your cows and your land to the value of your buildings and machinery, okay? So this is about cost-effective animal housing choices, and it's about minimizing buildings and machinery costs per cow and per hundredweight. And it's important to realize that I'm saying here, you know, per cow and especially per hundredweight, because I'm not suggesting that less buildings, less machinery is always better. For example, in the decision to have a barn versus outwinter your cows, and there's farmers doing both in the Northeast, not that many outwintering, but there are some. Um, my understanding is that you can produce more milk and or get away with feeding less grain if you have your cows in the barn in the winter, right? So there may be a reasonable payback period and it may be a cost-effective choice to have housing. So it's just thinking about minimizing buildings and machinery costs really per hundred weight, okay? And this low overhead dairy grazing system uh, is really trying to reduce total costs of production, the direct costs and the overhead costs per hundred weight. So the efficiencies that are inherent in this kind of a system, and I'm going to show you some pictures in the next few slides to give you a better sense of, I keep saying this system. I want to show you what it looks like. But feed efficiency, uh, I mean, all dairy farms are after feed efficiency, right? And I think the goal is to minimize feed costs per 100 weight milk shipped. How do you do that in a grazing system? Maximize the nutrient intake from grazing and smart supplemental feeding. Labor efficiency, hugely important on all dairy farms, right? Maximize the milk shipped per worker. I think the large modern confinement dairies are often over 2 million pounds per worker. Um, I think that the kind of farm that my dad had would probably be at about 250 or 300,000 pounds of milk per year per worker. Huge difference. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But again, you know, high throughput milking parlor, seasonal calving is a way to get labor efficiencies. And then what's talked about less often, I find, is capital efficiency, right? Really trying to maximize your rate of return on assets. And I think an important way to do that is minimize your overhead costs per hundredweight produced. And again, not just minimize them, period, but minimize them per hundredweight. Got to think about the impacts on 
production and where you want that production level to be. Hey, Kelsey, uh, just to check in with you, um, can you hear me okay? And have there been any questions? Uh, yes, looks great. And no questions in the okay. chat so far. Sounds great. Perfect. Yeah. So just a few pictures, and I'll go through them fairly quickly. Um, this is a farm in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, they outwinter their cows. They milk, I don't know, 200 and something cows. Uh, and they use these um, round bales, right? Put in a couple of directions to create windbreaks. They try to house, house the cows up on a hill. This farmer and others have told me that it's not the cold that's a problem for the cows, it's the mud. So really trying to keep them out of the mud. Here's a, a few pictures of, uh, you know, being out on the pasture in the winter time, um, setting out from round bales for feeding um, that the cows can access in the snow. Here's more of a close up of that. Um, I was in Missouri last year and got to visit a bunch of these kinds of farms. The New Zealanders, uh, a whole, an investment group from New Zealand came into Missouri and has set up a pod of 12 or more uh, farms that are between 550 and 750 cows each. They're generally spring calving. And so, you know, here's a really innovative way to feed a lot of calves quickly. And then also down there, a New Zealand style parlor, right? Where you've got the holding area and the crowd gate that circles around and pushes the cows into a swing parlor. Um, many of you, maybe most or all are familiar. If not, I'll just mention the swing parlor has a set of claws in the middle and they swing from side to side. So if this were a swing 20, you'd bring 20 cows in here. In this parlor, they get some grain fed and some they don't, um, but all the claws would be put on this side and then while those cows were milking, get 20 in the other side, prep them. And then as these ones finish, you just swing the, the claws over to the other side and then let this side out and bring in another set. So high throughput, you know, these parlors can milk 75 or 100 cows per person per hour. So um, on to the analysis that we've done. I want to describe to you uh, what we've done, and I hope it'll be clear. So there aren't very many farms like this in the Northeast. And even if there were, in dairy farm financial analysis, every farm has its own unique situation, circumstances, idiosyncrasies that sometimes make its numbers a little different. <laughs> uh, and so we felt it was better, and really we didn't have much choice because there aren't many farms with doing this system in the Northeast. We used an expert panel that included uh, three farmers who have systems like this in the Northeast, in New York and in Pennsylvania. I'm sad to say there weren't any in New England that we used, uh, but one was close. Um, and then a couple of farm financial experts to work with us to create hypothetical numbers that represent this kind of farming system and so there's a whole bunch of assumptions that go with it, and I'm going to explain those to you. This is a uh, um, modeling 240 cows on a rented farm that has 360 acres. Okay, the rent payment is seventy-eight thousand dollars per year for that farm. Um, we did start originally to look at like a greenfield development of building what you need on a blank piece of land. A um, couple problems with that. One, it turns out it's really expensive to build all that stuff now. And, and the numbers weren't that good looking. And also it might be less likely to find that big piece of open ground to, to do a greenfield development on, as opposed to perhaps renting a farm that used to house, you know, that had 360 acres that maybe had 120 or 140 cows in some kind of a free, smaller freestall that is sitting empty that could be rented. So that's what we're thinking about. So the farmer here borrowed $285,000 that was necessary for a herd of cows. They also borrowed an additional $240,000 to retrofit this rented farm with a swing 20 parlor, a drive-by covered feed bunk, drive-by on two sides, so it doesn't have to be as long, uh, and a bedded pack for emergency housing. OK, now for a lot of people, you think, well, wait, you're going to invest on a farm you don't own. Well, 
I've talked to a lot of lenders about this. And when you look at the internal rate of return on that investment on a farm, if you have a lease for, for 15 years, it's a very good investment to do. Ideally, maybe you'd have a uh, option to purchase at the end, but even if you didn't, it's still a uh, financially reasonable thing to do. So the farmer also owns 270,000 worth of machinery and uh, about half of that, half of that is, is, is debt financed still. So the total assets of this farm, 1.25 million. Now that is a lot less than if the farmer owned this 360 acres in those buildings, right? That, that's gonna add more to the total assets. I want you to keep that in mind because it, it impacts the rate of return on investment, but also, well, renting a farm that's available could be a good strategy. Um, so anyway, uh, 1.25 million in, in total assets, uh, about $5,200 per cow, okay? Even if you owned that farm, you'd still be at the low end of this range, which seems to be for, for farms in the Northeast between $10,000 and $22,000 of total assets per cow. So the operation of this hypothetical farm, medium framed cows, maybe you know small Holsteins or something else, I don't know, um, averaging 15,000 pounds of milk per cow per year, a spring calving herd. So it's seasonal and the whole herd is dry in January and February or part of January and February. Uh, the ration that this herd is being fed during the grazing season, 12 pounds of grain, six pounds dry matter of corn silage, and as much pasture as you can get them to eat. Uh, during the non-grazing season, it's 12 pounds of grain still, uh, now 12 pounds dry matter corn silage, and 17 pounds dry matter of haylage baleage. Um, on this farm, we assume an 18% cull rate. The farm raises replacements and sells the extras, which you'll see in the revenue lines that we get to in a minute. Uh, three workers managing this farm. There's the owner manager and two full-time hired people. Okay, so I wanna talk about the data we used and something called Monte Carlo simulation that we used. So for this analysis, we got milk price data and feed price data from the Northeast region from 2011 to 2021, okay? The average milk price was $19.20 per hundredweight. The expert panel thought it was conservative to assume that because of the grazing and the makeup of these cows that there'd be an average of $1.50 in premiums for fat and protein. Uh, above that. So um, I guess that's uh, 2070 would be sort of the, the, the real price. Um, and an average grain price from the data of um, two, $252 a ton. Okay. Because of all the variability that I showed you before in milk prices, and same is true in grain prices, um, averages become really a lot less meaningful to use. And so what we did was a Monte Carlo simulation, and I'll try to explain briefly what that is. <clears throat> we conducted this analysis in a spreadsheet and we set it up so that that spreadsheet gets calculated 10,000 times, right? And there's software that's used to do that. And each time, each iteration, it pulls a milk price and it pulls a feed price from the distribution of data, right? Based on these averages up here, of 1920, uh, really of, of 2070 and of uh, $252. So that average with the standard deviation from that data, you get a distribution, it pulls a milk price and a feed price. The data shows that those two things are correlated. They're not perfectly correlated, but there was a significant correlation, which is programmed into the Monte Carlo. So what that means is that less often than by chance, are you going to see a really high milk price and a super low feed price, right? Because, because they're correlated, that doesn't happen very often. So, so we try to reflect that in this analysis. It also varies the milk production level between 14,000 and 16,000, right? So the um, perfect storm worst situation is, okay, the cows are producing 14,000 at a really low milk price and a really high feed price. 
and the opposite is the best case scenario, right? So it, it calculates the spreadsheet 10,000 times and you get 10,000 set, 10,000, well, sets of outputs. So like net farm income per hundredweight, for example. And then you have a distribution of those outputs and you can see the probability of any given output. So I'm gonna talk about those a little bit. Um, in terms of the milk price distribution, um, this is what it looked like. The average there at 1920. Um, and importantly, the milk price to feed price ratio, right? This is a really important factor in dairy farm profitability, right? In a year with a high milk price and a low feed price, dairy farm is going to make a lot more money than they would in the opposite. Right. So the average across those 10,000 iterations, this ratio is 1.68, which should mean nothing to any of you. It didn't really mean anything to me. It's not a ratio that people talk about, but I want to put it in context for you here. So I was able to find data from USDA from 2010 to 2014, where they graphed out the milk to feed price ratio for dairy. Higher is better, right? So in September of 2014, and Kelsey, can you see my cursor? Yes, yeah, that's working. Okay, good. So up here, um, right, that's the best uh, of all those five years of data, right? That's the highest ratio. And the lowest is down here, right, in the summer of 2012. Um, our milk to feed price ratio was on average 1.68. So it puts it down here in the lower end, which again, we wanted all of the assumptions used in creating these numbers to be conservative. And, and this one certainly is. So the profit and loss statement, which I mentioned before, I didn't put up all these numbers for you to try to see them individually because that's, well, not good presentation style. I just wanted you to see that this is what it looks like. And we did analysis year one to year five. Right. And we made some changes in assumptions across those years because the farm's not going to come out of the gate at full speed. Right. There's some learning curve, et cetera. So it's the year five numbers that we really looked at mostly. And so in the revenue picture, as you'd expect, primarily it's milk income. There's cull cow sales, cull heifer sales, calf sales. But then there's also farm raised replacement sales. Right. And this is part of the advantage of having a lower culling rate. Right? You don't need as many replacements. And if you raise them, you can sell them or you could sell more calves. So this is what the revenue picture looks like. On the expense side, again, I don't want to go through all these numbers, but these columns on the right are the averages per cow and per hundredweight based on the year five numbers, which is what we consider to sort of be the steady state. Right, The farms got up and running um, and figured out what it needs to do to, to perform normally. So. Here, the feed, purchased grain, purchased haylage, purchased corn silage. Um, that totals, I think, $8.52, which I think is on the next slide. But what I want to say about this is that on any grazing farm, when the grass is growing faster than you can keep up with it, you're going to be harvesting some, some and storing it for stored feed. We made a conservative assumption that every bit of the ration that I described to you before was um, purchased or, or a, at least accounted for at a market value. And so that's where what, what's included in these costs. The other big one is labor and management, <clears throat> $4.55 per hundredweight. What I want you to understand is that that is not just the two hired workers. That includes a $55,000 per year salary that's paid to the owner manager of the farm. That's the same person, right? The owner of the farm. Um, that's a little different than is done in most dairy farm financial analyses, where when you calculate net farm income, it does not include the owner um, salary or payment. So um, the results, right? The full cost of production, $20.75 per hundredweight. Net farm income from operations, 103,000. Um, again, doesn't that that's after paying the owner that $55,000 salary. Um, per cow, 433 dollars. 
and the net farm income, the profit per hundredweight, $2.93. And again, I want to put that in some context for you guys in a, a moment. Um, rate of return on assets, 10.2%. Now, this is highly influenced by the fact that the denominator in that calculation is lower because the farm does not, the farmer does not own the land and buildings. Um, but it's still with that would be a very competitive ROA for dairy farming. Profit margin, almost 12%. As I mentioned, total feed cost per hundredweight, $8.52. And there's um, uh, 1.1, almost 1 1.2 million pounds milk shipped per worker. Significantly less than on the large modern confinement operations, significantly more than my dad's farm. <clears throat> so, I talked about in the Monte Carlo simulation, you get a distribution of outputs, right? So this is the distribution of net farm income per hundredweight. It's skewed a bit off to the right. Um, the mean is $2.93, which actually would be over here. So I missed it with that arrow a little bit. 80% um, of the 10,000, so eight, thousand of the 10,000 iterations of this spreadsheet calculation were between $1.30 and $4.56 of profit per hundredweight. Now to put that in some context, I was able to get numbers from farm credit and they were, they're great. And they, they put together numbers every year. They have that Northeast Dairy Farm Summary document they put out. Um, those are mostly large modern confinement operations. The average number of cows, I think, in 2021 was like 600 and something. So they're, they're larger herds. Um, the average net farm income per hundredweight after, so to compare apples to apples, um, taking a $55,000 salary and dividing it over the average number of hundredweights and subtracting that from, from their number, of net farm income would give you 171 per hundred weight, right? So this number here, 293 is about 70% greater than that. I don't expect anyone to take these numbers to the bank or to change their farming system based on these numbers. All I really think should happen is that folks who are interested to start to understand the, the potential of the system and look into it a little bit more closely for themselves. Um, my last few slides are just on the sort of external benefits that come with this kind of a system, the off-farm benefits, right? So there's potential benefits to rural communities, to the environment, and to the food system. And these are listed. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, what I did do a little bit of modeling on is the water quality impacts and the climate change impacts. And so I used USDA's integrated farm system model, which used to be called the dairy forage systems model or simulator. It's, it was a dairy specific model. It now does beef also, but it's a good model to use for this kind of thing. It's a daily, it's a process level simulation, right? That works on a daily time step. So it takes weather data from a weather station that you decide the nearest one to where you're trying to model a farm. And it takes daily weather over 25 years. And it basically models the biophysical processes on the farm and the economic processes. So what I did was- John, just yep. want to do a, a time check. We're at 12, 12, so about yeah. 15 minutes left, yeah. I appreciate it. And I'm, I'm gonna be done in about three minutes, Great. I think, or less. Thank you. So, so this comparison of this low overhead dairy grazing system versus a uh, a typical confinement system on the same farm footprint, right? So the same number of acres, same soil, same topography, same weather, right? It's the same farm we're modeling. Um, 360 acres, it's a clay loam gently sloping. And on the confinement operation, 130 cows, 24,000 pounds of cow, growing corn silage and haylage. And on the low overhead dairy grazing, it's 240 cows at 15,000 pounds of cow, as we were talking about in the financials it's all in permanent vegetative cover, right? It's all pasture with, you know, and, and some haylage made off of it. <clears throat> so in terms of phosphorus loss, what the model shows, total phosphorus loss of 
uh, 0.7 pounds per acre per year in the confinement and 0.2 pounds for the grazing system. It's a 71% reduction. Has important potential water quality uh, impacts if there were more farms grazing. In terms of nitrogen loss, the, the leaching and runoff pounds per acre is a 62% reduction for the grazing system over the confinement. And the reactive nitrogen footprint, which takes into account all these different aspects of nitrogen, um, a 26% reduction. In terms of climate change, the net greenhouse gas emissions, which includes all of the major greenhouse gases and soil carbon, sequest carbon sequestration in the soil, just it's not that very different. Right? It's a 5% less for the, for the grazing farm. Now, I'll just say about that, that feeding grain to cows is probably the best way to reduce enteric methane emissions from the cow, right? The, the hotter the ration, or the hotter the ration, the less enteric uh, methane emissions. Um, more forage, like you're going to get in a pasture-based ration, more enteric emissions. However, in this system, you're gonna have less emissions from manure storage uh, and you're gonna have the soil carbon sequestration. So, um, the, uh, in last, my last slide really is the other benefits, right? There's potential benefits of having permanent vegetative cover for birds, for pollinators. There's been some research in the upper Midwest about its impact on cold water streams and the, and the trout fisheries. Potential impacts on rural communities, the economic multiplier of having more farms that are profitable in a community rather than fewer larger farms. Tourism impacts and the aesthetic working landscape of having cows grazing and reduced odors. Farm safety, worker conditions and opportunities for ownership to get in uh, on a system that requires less upfront investment. And on the food system, right? Longer lived animals, reduced incidence of disease and reduced antibiotic use. Um, there's the CLA and the omega-3 fatty acid issue, and there's research been done on it. I don't know how impactful it is, but there, a lot of these things have pointed towards benefits for grazing, and there's an easier transition to organic and grass-fed. So the takeaway points, um, ideally business decisions are based on profitability, not on cash flow. Uh, so when the milk to grain price ratio gets really low, if you're not tied in by cash flow concerns, maybe it's more profitable to feed less grain and produce less milk, right? That, that'd be nice to be, have that option. Um, in sustained lulls, you know, in a farm like that, you could pivot towards beef for a while and then go back to dairy. Uh, I mean, it just seems that it's a bit more flexible. The efficiencies I talked about, feed efficiency, labor efficiency, and capital efficiency, 70% uh, greater uh, profit per hundred weight, although, you know, this number is hypothetical and this number is an average from a small set of large farms. Um, it still looks to be quite promising. And generally it's a win-win system as far as I can tell. So my biases are on the table, but I think we did this analysis with as much conservative assumptions as possible. And I'll just stop there. Uh, my email's there if you want to get in touch with me for anything after this, but let's open it up to questions, please. Thanks so much, John. There, there was a question from Jen Miller. Jen, I don't know if you want to ask it or I can can read it. It's a clarifying um, that it looked like in the environmental comparison model, environmental comparison, the lodge model farm was not feeding corn silage, but corn silage was included in the ration for financial modeling. Why are they different and why is corn included in the lodge model? I think I'm, I might have been unclear on that. Um, corn silage, in all the modeling we did, corn silage was fed um, at six pounds of dry matter during the grazing season and 12 pounds in the non-grazing season. And it, uh, oh, in the, I see, in the environmental. No, it was feeding corn silage also, uh, purchased corn silage in the IFSM modeling. Jen, does that I, hope, I hope that gets at the question. question. <clears throat> I'm not a dairy farmer, but um, what a lot of dairy farmers have said to me is they really like 
corn silage. I've talked to some organic producers who can't get organic corn silage and really miss feeding corn silage because of the amount of milk that it makes, apparently so. You're welcome to come off mute and ask ask a question or pop it in the chat if you like. <clears throat> I may have missed this, John. Could you explain again how you came up with the animal numbers in each scenario? Is that derived from? So topic? like, it's especially in the comparison? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So to start with the 240 cows, working with the expert panel, <clears throat> we were thinking about, you know, what's the likely, what's a chunk of land, what, what's, it's gonna vary, but you know, what's a sort of likely herd size that would fit with the kind of farm sizes that might be available in the Northeast, right? So we landed on 240 cows. Um, I don't think that 240 cows is the economic optimum if you had unlimited land to access, right? Like those farms in Missouri that have between 550 and 750 cows per farm managed by four people, 150 cows per worker. And, and it's really quite impressive. Um, in terms of the comparison with the confinement model on that same farm footprint, we were just thinking about what might be typical on 360 acres of land for a typical dairy, you know, a traditional confinement dairy in the Northeast. We have a Does that answer your question, Sonia? Sorry. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah. Okay. Because normally I, I, I see, right, confinement slash annual crops supporting generally more farms because the annual crop kind of, because corn silage does make more milk, like you were saying, John. Um, Supporting so, more cows, did you mean when you said more farms? Sorry, yeah, that's what I mean, more cows uh, per, mm -hmm. per, yeah. per land unit. Yeah, yeah, could be. We have a question in the chat from Jaime Garcon. The simulation system also included the lost nutrients and greenhouse gas produced by the corn crop used to make the feed in the confinement system. That's a good question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I haven't dug into the guts of, you know, all the equations behind the scenes in, in the IFSM model. I say that reluctantly because M stands for model. It's like ATM machine. It's a little redundant, but... Um, I haven't uh, looked at all the equations, but but in the user guide, and, and I work quite closely with um, Al Rotz from USDA ARS who created that model. Um, it accounts for embedded emissions in the inputs that go in because it does a carbon footprint. Great, thanks. I do have a report that um, summarizes these numbers. Uh, I'd be happy to share with anyone if you want it. If you want it, you could email me and, uh, and I'll send you a copy. That's not fancy, but it just sort of describes what was presented here. It actually doesn't go into the environmental comparison, although I might add that into a later version. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm curious. Um, I know this is one way of getting this information out to farms, this webinar we're on right now. And like, how else are you trying to share this message or this research um, with, with Vermont farmers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, through whatever channels I can, and I was, again, really grateful uh, to Kelsey and Glenda and Sarah for um, putting this webinar together. Um, I've talked about it at a couple of conferences and um, 
you know, what, what I really want to do, I don't want this to be, and it's, it's not academic research, right? It, it's really food for thought. And I'd love to get it into the hands of as many farmers as possible. Again, not for them to believe it and make changes based on it, but to get them thinking, hmm, is that true? And start looking into it more. Um, that, that's my thought process. Our DBIC project also has the ability to help some interested farmers to do some technical planning and some financial planning on how to move in this direction. Um, and so we're trying to get the word out on that also. So thanks for that question. I'm open to any suggestions that folks have for uh, good ways to get the word out to farmers or people who support farmers. I think, John, one thing we talked about that I, I thought would be maybe a, a great draw for farmers was including um, a panel or some of the, the farms, the farm experts that you worked with. Um, you showed photos, but having them talk about their experience with it mixed with yeah. the discussion of the modeling, I think would be great. That's a great idea. At what kind of venue, I wonder? Um, because, you know, the... The thing about these, these farms are pretty far apart in terms of hours driving, even in the Northeast. Um, so to bring them together, it'd be good to do that where there was going to be a, you know, a adequate audience. So um, uh, maybe I'll follow up with you on that, Kelsey, to see, because I think that's a great idea. Great. Yeah, uh, the conference or another webinar, maybe. Sorry, someone's going to ask a question. Are you, yeah, I can. Are you done with what you're saying, Kelsey? I can. Yeah, I'm done. Done. Okay. I was just wondering if how hard it would be for you just to run a model with like with an ownership setup because obviously like there's farms exiting that need to sell. They don't have the option, or they have no or like or it's conserved and there's only one house lot, right? So like there's it's just like the very real limitations in terms of like leasing the the property out. Um, and there's people that value ownership. Um, so just in terms of like getting, you know, obviously we probably you'd have to make other assumptions, but could that be done so that you'd have like a model where they had that those higher interest payments um, and you'd have to adjust, but yeah, how how do you, how realistic yeah. is that to see you'd have like across the board comparison yeah. of like yeah. higher overhead, but building equity? Yeah, yeah. I think that that'd be fairly easy to do. Um, the impacts are not in that many places in the analysis to change. The one thing I do want to say is that yeah, while you would have principal and interest payments, um, that $78,000 per year rent payment is supposed to reflect the cost, right? So then you wouldn't have that. And I'm not, you know, it would change the rate of return on assets it would change the net farm income some, but maybe not that much, but it, it's a great, given that what I had described in this presentation is sort of a unique kind of circumstance, especially investing to retrofit on a farm you don't own, uh, it might be a really good idea. So it's a, a good suggestion. I'm glad you mentioned it to, to, to look at another scenario uh, of ownership. Good question, Dan. Um, John, Sonia messaged uh, in the chat that um, if you wanted to write a 500 word summary, they might be able to share it in AgReview. Um, right. It's often right. open to anyone. And if there was a water quality relevant editorial articles, um, you could CC Sonia to help elevate that. So the, the link to the AgReview editorial guidelines is in the chat. Great. Um, can, can you sort of repeat the last part about water quality? I didn't quite get that point. Um, if We're submitting the, oh, thanks, there's there's some... that egg review takes from anyone who has news of interest to Vermont egg, egg review right goes out to farmers to their 
mailboxes once a month. So there is that process that's for like any news that's relevant um, and, and, you know, non, not like business advertising per se, but more, more news. Um, But I help manage some of the water quality content. And so I may be able to squeeze things in, but so just CC me if you are. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thank you very much. And I wonder if there's a, a synonymous thing in New Hampshire and Maine. New York and Pennsylvania, for that matter. Yeah, I'd reach out for sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. That's really important. Well, in the silence, I will say that um, I always feel a little bad uh, with presentations like this, so many numbers and I guess I'm partly grateful that we're not in the same room together, so I can't see your eyes glaze over, but I hope, you know, it was clear enough and you understood what we were trying to do, what we did and, uh, and what the results were. Dan Miller says not the case, love the numbers. Thank you. All right, we're just about to 12.30. Any last last questions before we wrap up? Okay, um, I will stop the recording. Like I said, I'll make that available. I'll email it to everyone who registered and then um, it should also be on the UVM Extension YouTube page within about a week, the media team will help us put that together. Um, Thank you again, John, for a great presentation and um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, uh, Glenda and Sarah and and DBIC also. Thanks very much. Thanks everybody.